Thank you. How'd I do? You did good. You ready? <laughs> I'm ready. You ready? Okay. Three, two, oh no, I want to, I, I, I want to do it again. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. I have to do the three, two, one. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. Hello. I have all of those questions right here, and I have, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I have Lou with me. Go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself. You're a board Hello, student. friends. Today we have a very special video for you. I have asked Lou, Dr. Lou, to come on and answer some of your questions. I put out on Instagram ask me questions for a board certified urologist and so many of you did we have it right here tons of them this video could go one hour we don't care however the sun may change that because right now it's beautiful but it may get bad who knows but we're going to just fly by the seat of our pants which i usually do in my videos and first i'm going to let lou tell you a little bit about himself so why don't you tell him about yourself <laughs> Well, you're right. I'm a retired uh, urologist, uh, practiced about 30 years in Western New York and uh, now retired here in Southwest Florida. And I'm here today to answer questions. All right. And I know one of the uh, questions that was asked that I'll have you answer before we get into the nitty gritty, because so many of you had really good questions. But one question was, what do you miss most about practicing? Um, what do I miss most about practicing? I would say that uh, interaction with patients on a daily basis, because in our field, we get to know them intimately. And so for that reason, I miss that daily interaction. Uh, I also miss the camaraderie of um, the people from the hospital and the office. Uh, again, those are people you get to know very, very closely and work side by side for years. So yeah, that, they become family. Yeah, it is. It's an extended family. And I would say that's uh, what I miss the most. All right. Well, I don't miss the calls. No, neither, <laughs> the neither, late night calls. Neither do I. We don't miss those at all. I'm all going right. To get started and ask Lou all of your questions. We have pages and pages and pages and he's loaded for bear. I fed him well this morning. Huh. Um, <laughs> all right. So the first question comes from Lisa. I'm just going to say your first name instead of your whole screen name. And she wants to know, are cranberry supplements necessary? Well, Lisa, thank you for your question. Uh, cranberry supplements, I guess I would say they're not going to hurt you. Uh, are they going to stop urinary tract infections? Probably not. Uh, can they maybe help uh, in some fashion? Yes, they, they can create an acidic environment within urine uh, within the bladder, which is hostile to bacteria. And for that reason, they may offer benefit. The literature on that is mixed. I wouldn't say there's a definitive conclusion that they're necessary, but it certainly isn't going to hurt you. Okay. The next question is, what the heck is a urologist anyway? <laughs> uh, urologist is a, uh, a surgeon, primarily. Uh, we train in general surgery and in urologic surgery. Uh, but we kind of straddle the fence between medicine and surgery because a lot of what we do uh, in our uh, office setting uh, is office medicine, but um, we are also surgeons uh, and do quite a bit of um, uh, general type surgery. Uh, like what organs do you deal with? Uh, anything from uh, kidney, bladder, prostate uh, in the male. Uh, we deal with the urogenital system, the so testes um, uh, and um, things like erectile dysfunction, stone disease, uh, cancer, cancer, yeah, cancer anywhere in the urologic tract. Uh, but then it can be anything from erectile dysfunction to pediatric urology to uh, female urology. Those are all uh, encompassing in a general urologist practice. Okay, that's what a urologist is. All right, next question comes from Dean, and she wants to know, what causes kidney stones in a child at the age of 12, and what is the preferred treatment? Well, that's, that's a, a big question. Uh, I would say that um, uh, stone disease in general is multifactorial, meaning it, there are many different causes. Um, I would say primarily the most important thing to consider in stone disease is hydration status. And that is, 
uh, you have to keep your urine dilute in stone forming patients to prevent salts, which stones are made of, from precipitating out. There are many different types of stones, so it's kind of hard in a general question to say specifically what the cause is. In a child, there may be a genetic predisposition. Sometimes there are stones that have a, a genetic, genetic component. Um, you know, without further information and study, it would be hard to give a, a definitive answer. But for all stone patients, the number one priority is hydration and keep the urine dilute. I, I used to tell my patients all the time, you never want to see a lot of color in your urine. You always want it dilute, which means that the salts then that are in the urine are going to stay in a solute or in a liquid form and not have a chance to crystallize and, and form stones, which eventually will cause problems. So hydration is a big thing. Yeah. Okay. The solution to pollution is dilution. So just keep on drinking so you can keep on peeing. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the next one comes from Cindy3. I always feel like I have a bladder infection, but the tests always come back negative. Um, well, thank you, Cindy3, and I hope Cindy1 and 2 are doing well. <laughs> you can let that part of you out, too. <laughs> Lou's a very, very funny man. <laughs> The, um, what you're describing is what we would call irritative voiding symptoms. Uh, and that is, uh, those are, are men and women who have symptoms of a UTI, like frequency, urgency, um, symptoms voiding in small amounts. Uh, a lot of times that can be uh, due to an overactive bladder where the bladder uh, becomes irritable for many different reasons. Uh, and that leads to uh, a sense of frequency and urgency. Um, sometimes there can be underlying medical conditions behind that, which are too numerous to go into right now. But um, if that's something persistent, then that probably should be evaluated further if um, cultures are coming back negative. Okay. Um, this comes from Kate. We already answered yours. You wanted to know what Dr. Louie missed most about practicing. So we're going to move on to Aquarius girl. And she said, do signs of kidney stones show up in your blood work? Um, well, again, as I said, stone disease is a very large field and there are many different types of stones. But I think what you're referring to is something like if you had a calcium containing stone, might you see something in the blood that would suggest a, a calcium stone? And the answer to that would be yes. If you had something like hyperparathyroidism, then the calcium level in your bloodstream would be elevated. Uh, matter of fact, it wasn't uncommon for myself to pick up a, an example of hyperparathyroidism or a case of hyperparathyroidism based on uh, a stone patient and then working backwards to find that they had a problem with their parathyroid gland. So yes, uh, some stones you will pick up in blood work, uh, but not all. Okay, so the next one is, why would a 52-year-old woman who has never had children have bladder issues? Well, I think being a 52-year-old woman could be a main contributor to having uh, bladder issues. 52-year-old woman most likely is in or entering menopause. I'm assuming she means leaking. Maybe leakage when well, she sneezes and laughs? Could be, okay. or, or could be some of those frequency urgency symptoms that the previous um, um, person asked about. Okay. So it's not uncommon when, when women get into their 50s that we start seeing them for urologic issues. It could be incontinence um, or leakage, as was mentioned, or it could be the frequency urgency symptoms, or it could be development of urinary tract infections. These are all very common problems to develop once you enter into menopause due to the lack of estrogen. I had to just stop and to remind Louie that he has to look in the lens. This is the first time Louie's ever done any video, so he needs to look right in the lens. He's looking down a little bit, and I know somebody will say something about us, so we are correcting it, okay? Okay. All right, so the next one comes from Lori. I want to know what Lou thinks about, you know what, I'm gonna, okay, well, we'll go on with this. This one is not really about, although it could, Lori wants to know what you think about the keto diet. Um, what do I think about keto? Well, being someone who is somewhat on keto. Dirty. Dirty keto. The man it. does some dirty uh, keto. Dirty <laughs> keto. Uh, I, I would say that, I mean, it certainly works. Tell them why you ch we had to change your diet. Well, I was uh, overweight. Um, 
probably about 35 pounds heavier than I am right now, uh, right before I retired. It's because I cook so well. And uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, and when I went for blood work, uh, I had some issues that needed to be corrected. Um, and uh, my primary care was talking about my options would be going forward. And they started talking about medications, the typical stuff you would see in a guy my age, things like... Uh, um, in lieu of 60. Yes, cholesterol and, you know, blood sugar, uh, things like that. And, you know, I, I basically told them that I wasn't going to go on medication, that I felt that I could, through diet and exercise, probably control this. And, and they snickered, didn't they? They, they challenged me, and, <laughs> and, and I won. So uh, We won. <laughs> yeah, so we, <laughs> we won. Through, through a combination of uh, diet and exercise, you know, I was able to uh, normalize Lens. my blood work. Uh, and... Um, you know, now I'm down about 35 pounds with dirty keto and, and exercise every day. And uh, it's kept me from having to be on uh, medications. Because kidneys are part of what you do, practice, your practice, right. do you feel that keto can be harmful to the kidneys? Um, I think everything in moderation. So if, if you were to overdo it with protein uh, as you age, that could put stress on your kidneys. Um, the kidneys don't like to be overloaded with, with protein. Uh, but f just from a standpoint of healthy fats and avoiding um, you know, heavy carbohydrates, I don't think that's going to cause any issue uh, with kidneys. I, I would just, you know, if you're, if you're considering it and you, you, before you start, you might want to go to your primary physician, have your renal function checked to make sure they don't see any issue if you were going to be pushing protein. But um, uh, in and of itself, I don't think keto would be a, a problem for somebody with normal kidney function. If they're doing keto the right way, it is actually higher fat, moderate protein. Yeah. But some people confuse that and they think, I'm going to eat all the protein meat you know, that I want. And that is not really keto. Keto is moderate protein, high healthy fats, and low carb. So if they're following it the right way, they should not run into issues. But if they're doing it more like the Atkins way, that's yeah. all protein. That yeah. would become an issue. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, this comes from Claire. Do most people suffer from impaired kidney function as a result of aging? Uh, thank you, Claire. It is normal as people age to see uh, a reduction in their kidney function. Uh, I would say it's rare to have people in their... 70s and 80s with perfectly normal kidney function. And that's, again, there's a lot of factors involved with that, such as uh, blood flow problems to the kidney or damage that can occur to the filtration system of the kidney that are related to very common issues, things like high blood pressure and diabetes. Um, you know, if, if you have problems with um, diseases like that, then you're probably going to have some degree of um, Kid, redu reduction in your kidney function as you age. Okay, this one here is also more towards aging. Why do UTIs in elderly women present like dementia? Learn this from my granny, and this is from Lisa Desmonds. Yeah, uh, Lisa, that, that's a, a good point. Um, in the elderly population, the, the um, octogenarians, um, sometimes even younger, uh, one of the uh, first signs, you definitely see this in nursing homes, where one of the first signs that a, a patient might have a urinary tract infection is a, a change in their mental status. Um, the exact reason for that, you know, I can't give you a, a good scientific answer for that. But, you know, nurses are clued in and, and they'll pick up on the fact that there's been a change in mental status. And, you know, that's when they'll start looking for an infection before it becomes something more serious like sepsis. Next one comes from Tiana, and it says he had CHD. What is that? I think coronary heart disease okay. is what she's saying. And I'm wondering if he should have surgery. Um, well, that's that's kind of a tough <laughs> idea. I mean, I don't, that could also be chronic hemodialysis. So if, if it's coronary heart disease, again, that's too broad of a statement to, to, or, to um, make a comment on that. Um, if it's chronic chemodialysis, again, I, I don't think I can comment on that because there's not enough information. And please keep in mind, we are only here answering questions. Lou is not diagnosing anyone, nor is he giving you medical 
advice of what you should go and do. No. You're just answering questions, uh, and he's putting all his years of experience into answering your questions. He is not diagnosing any of you. You must see your own urologist. Or primary care physician. Yes, position. okay. All right, just wanted to get that out there, friends. Okay, so the next one is, uh, this is a part, uh, okay, this one is from Tiana also. Oh, okay, this might clarify it a little bit better for you. She says, my dad is 84 years old and has heart disease, about 40% function left. His prostate is so enlarged that he must use a catheter all the time since February. I'm wondering if he would be a candidate for prostate surgery at all. He is quite bothered by the catheter, but I think that he should not have surgery. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Okay, this, this would be something that I encountered frequently in practice you know, an octogenarian with, um, in this case, heart disease. And the question is um, for quality of life, because living with a catheter is, is no fun and it, it itself can lead to problems. You know, can a gentleman like this uh, safely have a surgical procedure to get him voiding or urinating again? That's something the first step I think would be talking to the primary, maybe getting, I'm sure he probably has a cardiologist if, if he has heart disease at 84. That would be a discussion with the cardiologist on the risks uh, related to having anesthesia for a procedure. Now, there are some minimally invasive procedures now that can be done either under sedation, maybe not quite local, but under sedation or, or um, a quick general. If he could be cleared by your cardiologist for a general anesthetic, then he might be a candidate for one of the minimally invasive procedures that might get him urinating. I mean, no promises, no one's gonna ever guarantee you that. But, you know, for quality of life, that's a risk benefit. We always talk about that in medicine. You know, what's the risk benefit here? And the benefit would be quality of life um, without a catheter, the risk being having to have a surgical procedure in anesthesia with heart disease. So that's something, something that uh, you, your dad, and a cardiologist, as well as the surgeon would have to uh, discuss and, and then come to a, a group decision. Okay, let's see. How wonderful am I? <laughs> you? <laughs> you're terrific. I want, I want you to loosen up a little bit. They need to know that you're funny and you're fabulous. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting on the I doctor. I got the doctor code on. I know, here. but I don't need a robot doctor, okay? I want uh, my Louie doctor. No. All right, here comes from Pink Poodle. Best advice for women after childbearing years with slight leakage. Okay, so uh, incontinence uh, after um, uh, childbearing, that, I mean, that's a very common problem. And what would I recommend? Well, I'm sure you're probably already doing the Kegel type exercises uh, that um, women learn to do. Do they really uh, work, Lou? Uh, if you have very mild symptoms, it may help. Okay. Um, certainly not gonna hurt you. Uh, the next step, I think, would be something like pelvic floor rehabilitation, which does work. Um, you know, you can go to a practice that offers that, so oftentimes associated with a physical therapist. Uh, and through a, a combination of um, uh, nerve and muscle stimulation and exercise training, uh, you definitely can help mild incontinence symptoms. Uh, when things get worse than that, then more than likely you're going to need to have some sort of surgical procedure in order to get dry. Okay, the next one is from Ready Bobby, and she wants to know, does the AZO formula for leaky bladder really help? We got a ton of questions about UTI and leaky bladders. Yeah. So did the AZO, that medication? I, I, I'm a little confused why people think that um, um, AZO, a, AZO is, is going to help with Oh, is that what it is, Azo? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was A-Z-O. Azo. No, well, I say Azo. I mean, <laughs> may, may, maybe it is. <laughs> okay, well, somebody <laughs> out here will tell us, <laughs> believe me. Potato, potato, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I, that's something that uh, is more of an anesthetic for the bladder yeah. um, that women often will use when they have a UTI or UTI-type symptoms. Um, but as far as stopping leakage, no. Uh, that's not going to have any 
benefit. It's not even people. really going to address the issue of a urinary tract infection. All it's going to do oh, is it's going to mask. take the pain away. That's yeah, it. That's actually not a good thing. Yes. I mean, you want, you want to have a diagnosis before you start treating yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let's move on. All right. Okay. This comes from donor one, two, three. What can we do for the leaks from sneezing post-menopause wise besides Kegels or Kegels, however yeah. you said it? That, that goes back to what I said, the pelvic floor rehab. What be, is that? What is pelvic floor rehab? Pelvic floor rehab is a program uh, usually run uh, with the urologist and or physical therapist where they will do um, uh, almost, it's not biofeedback, but it's training women to actually exercise the muscles of the pelvic floor appropriately because you, just telling somebody how to do it doesn't work. You have to um, hook them up to uh, um, probes that allow measurement of the muscle contraction. And then they also have uh, a small device that goes intravaginally that can actually stimulate the muscles uh, of the pelvic floor. And the women both feel that and there's a benefit from the uh, neural stimulation itself. So it's basically a combination of nerve stimulation and proper education on exercise to uh, get um, a benefit of uh, treating the incontinence. And then again, if it's not controlled by that, then you have to consider surgical procedures to try and control the incontinence. If you want more personality, you can't, I mean, I can't when I'm answering a clinic. No, I know, no, I know. About but heart disease and I stuff, know. they make light of it. Yeah, this is much better. The, oh, no, no, I know. Yeah. The only thing I'm saying is you make sure you're looking right in the lens. Right. And just pretend it's, it's a sure. golf ball or something, whatever. Okay, this question comes from Lisa. Why do women suffer incontinence with menopause and will it ever go away? Lisa, the reason women in menopause uh, or in menopause years tend to have incontinence it's probably a, a more than one factor involved there. For example, obviously women are in, in their 50s generally when they go into menopause. And, you know, as, as women age, and especially after having children, you get some laxity in the muscles of the pelvic floor from stretching um, uh, through uh, delivery. You also lose the benefits of estrogen. Uh, and that combination with aging and some weakening of the musculature that happens with age leads to the fact that uh, women will develop some incontinence often uh, as they um, are in the menopausal years. All righty. So now we're going to move on over to Genevieve. And she wants, she says, I have Crohn's. Is it normal to have many UTIs with it? Well, uh, Crohn's disease, for people out there who don't know, is uh, an autoimmune disease. That's where your body's fighting itself. Your immune system is actually fighting your GI tract, and that leads to a lot of crampy pain and inflammation and ulcerations, and it can be a very debilitating disease. So to treat that, many of the drugs that they will use are to suppress the immune system, like steroids or, or other medications. And when you suppress the immune system, you're suppressing the body's ability to prevent infection. And so for that reason, those patients are at a higher risk to develop infection. Um, Crohn's in itself too can create some problems in the urinary tract, uh, things like stone disease and other uh, issues. So yeah, it's, it's, um, unfortunately it's a tough disease and, and the cure or the treatment sometimes can lead to other problems. Okay. This one comes from Crowell, and they want to know, does Pacron help prevent UTIs? How do you spell that? Pacron. P-A-C-R-A-N. It's got a... I'm not familiar with Pacron. I think this, um, I, I think it might be a mistype, but we'll go on to the next question. Let me, let me see if I can maybe... It's got to have something to do with cranberry. Oh, yeah, there may that may be a trade name for a product out there that has some sort of uh, so you know, we pretty a, much addressed that a, a pro proprietary. Um, I think we talked about this. Before. Yeah, cranberry supplements. Yeah, it's just, it's a proprietary yeah. blend that has cranberry supplements in it. Whether that's better than just cranberry Straight supplements cranberry. themselves, I I have I don't know. I don't think that's at least I don't know of that being tested. And that's a good doctor for you right there. Just say I don't know if you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so okay. uh, next from Beanbag, 
percentage of men that will get prostate cancer? Excellent question, Beanbag. Um, <laughs> the, she doesn't the, uh, mind being called Beanbag. Uh, cool. uh, so prostate cancer uh, is, a, is an age-related disease. Uh, in practice, we'd often say if a man lives long enough, he's going to have prostate cancer. And what we mean by that is if you look at prostates of men who die in their 90s of natural causes, if you were to look at their prostate, probably eight or nine out of 10 of them would have areas of prostate cancer within their prostate gland. But so what? They lived to be in their exactly. 90s and had no issue with it. Uh, so that's why we say in urology, there's a big difference in dying with prostate cancer than dying of prostate cancer. And in, in your... Hmm? I was just going to say, because I've heard you talk about you'll have a family that comes in with their 90-year-old father, and they want them to have the surgery. Oh, yeah. No. I think that's the point you're trying to make. It's better yeah. to die with it than from it. Sure. Yeah. What, but what we're trying to pick up in urology is we're trying to identify the men at a much younger age who are at risk of dying from their prostate cancer, you know, in the 40s and 50s who are potentially at risk to get a very bad prostate cancer because there, there's prostate cancer and then there's prostate cancer. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're, we're trying to pick up the guys who have very bad disease who with early intervention can be cured and, and live a normal uh, life span. Okay, next one comes from S Rocks. Frequent UTIs with menopause when you are afraid of vaginal estradiol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Again, this goes back to uh, what we talked about before and how common it is for women in their postmenopausal years to get urinary tract infections. And there are things that uh, women can do to try and help you know, prevent their infections, whether that's uh, uh, drinking f large volumes of fluids to keep uh, flushed out, right, to keep those bad bacteria out, um, things like the cranberry supplements. What about uh, probi probiotics? Uh, probiotics trying to create a healthy uh, flora uh, because what happens in menopause, I, uh, here I'll get technical for a second. Just Oh, you haven't been? No. Oh. <laughs> Sem Semi-technical. What happens in, men <laughs> in menopause is that when you lose the estrogen, the normal vaginal cells uh, atrophy, they kind of wither away. And then normally they uh, release sugars or, or, or glucose type uh, products into the vaginal area that that lead to good bacteria like the lactobacilli in that area. Okay, so those are good bacteria, and they push out the bad pathologic bacteria like E. coli, which cause UTIs. When you have the lack of estrogen for whatever reason, then the um, uh, production of those or the presence of those lactobacilli, go, they go away and the bad bacteria can colonize that area. In surgery, we always say everything below the waist is dirty, but there are good bacteria and bad bacteria. And when you lose the estrogens, you lose uh, the ability to uh, push away those bad bacteria. Um, I, you know, I totally understand the, um, I don't say dilemma, uh, the controversy over supplemental estrogens. Uh, often in my practice, we would use small amounts of topical estrogen, like an S-trace type cream. Um, Honest, few... so he's just going to uh, so, finish that up. Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, where we got cut off is I was starting to say that in, in our practice, we often will use small amounts of, uh, of an S-trace type cream uh, that we apply in the vagina. Maybe uh, the patient would do it herself um, two or three times a week. Um, and this would help promote the good flora and also the good um, healthy tissue in that area to help prevent infection. Um, but I certainly, in, in, using small amounts like that leads to a very small amount of absorption in the body. But I certainly understand the dilemma some women are in where they don't want to take uh, estrogens. Yes, they don't want to take estrogens uh, because of potential um, uh, problems with with that. So oh, let's see. Uh, wow, no questions, but thankful you are doing this. Yay, Dr. Lou. <laughs> That's really nice. Okay, this comes from Mary Bowman, and she says, yes, my gyno referred me to a urologist. I am 68 years old, I am a female, and I pee all the time with an overactive bladder. 
Um, good question. And we, we touched on this a little bit before about uh, those frequency urgency symptoms, which often go with overactive bladder. One thing with that, and you know, I, I, I will put this out there, you, you can't just ignore irritate avoiding symptoms because sometimes there are underlying uh, disease processes uh, with the bladder uh, that need to be identified. You know, I'm not trying to scare anybody out there, but if, if you're having those and you're not having infections, uh, and certainly if they're identifying any blood in your urine, or if you see blood in your urine, uh, then you should be getting evaluated to make sure there isn't something more serious going on. There can be blood in the urine without seeing it though, correct? Yes, that's, that's called microscopic hematuria, and that's picked up on either a dipstick uh, as an initial screening test and then a formal urinalysis where they actually look for the red blood cells in the, in the uh, urine. Okay. This comes from Lisa T. 33. Does menopause cause bladder issues, and are there any vitamins to take for bladder health? Um, well, we, we've kind of touched on this uh, on, on several different questions. Uh, certainly, menopause does contribute to bladder issues, both irritative and infections, as we talked about. Um, is there any specific vitamin that you can take? I, I wouldn't say there's any specific vitamin um, that is, is necessarily going to uh, be life-changing there. Um, I think a healthy diet and, and a multivitamin might be the, the best I would. How much does genetics play a role in urinary health? Oh, significant. Right, body habitus. Um, you know how many children you've had. Um, you know how early you went into menopause. Um, you know how po how strong your immune system is. All all of those things factor in to whether or not you're going to have uh, either infections or uh, have problems with um, prolapse and and you know or the what people refer to as a drop bladder. Uh, all of those things factor in. Uh, so yeah, genetics plays a huge role in that. Okay. Uh, this one is chronic headaches. What could be the cause? Um, that comes from Sherry. Sherry, good question. I'm a drain surgeon, not a brain surgeon. <laughs> so. And I know she's laughing because I know who she is. <laughs> see, so you're you're going to need to uh, <laughs> go and see your yeah, yeah. brain. Okay. All right. So this comes from Myra Hendricks. Use of testosterone shots in your 60s. Well, that, you know, that touches on a very big um, uh, area in urology, you know, male andropause or the male menopause. Um, you know, as men age, they uh, lose the um, amount of testosterone that they produce. And a lot of guys in their 50s and 60s, they'll start to notice that they're, they're losing a little bit of their strength or their muscle mass or they're, they're more tired. And so... Um, due to advertising in that, they'll oftentimes hear about testosterone replacement as a panacea for, for those types of symptoms. And so then they'll end up coming to the urologist. Um, you know, can you replace testosterone? Certainly you can, um, but just like with any drug or medication, especially- Estrogen, a, HRT. Right, with any drug or, uh, uh, or steroid in this case, you need to realize that there are potential side effects. So it's, it's a risk-benefit discussion that you need to have with your um, family physician and or urologist uh, as to whether or not you would want to go on that should you be diagnosed with low testosterone or low T as they call it. Um, certainly I had many patients who benefited from it, but they need to be monitored for you know, potential side effects from it. I love a smart man. Okay, uh, this comes from Connie, <laughs> and this says, I've had hematuria for years, never showing bacteria. Is this an indicator of trouble ahead? Uh, Connie, a good question, and I, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, if you have blood in your urine and it's not associated with a urinary tract infection, that needs to be evaluated. Uh, you need to rule out other causes for that whether it's a subclinical infection, a kidney stone, or God forbid, something worse like a, a tumor or malignancy in the urinary tract. That needs to be evaluated sooner rather than later. And what are, uh, what are some of the tests that she uh, could have for that? Well, to I, find I would, out. yeah, I would leave that up to obviously the, the physician, but a standard evaluation for blood in the urine by a urologist would be some sort of what we call upper tract imaging, which is most cases, a, a CAT scan with contrast, if the patient can have it, 
uh, along with an endoscopy known as cystoscopy where we would visually examine the bladder. That's a local procedure done in the office. Um, it takes like five minutes, um, uncomfortable but not painful. And you know that's something in the wheelhouse of any urologist. Okay, this oh. one comes from Hopeful 1157. Best way to avoid further kidney stones? Uh, well, Hopeful, as I, I said earlier, the number one thing you can do to prevent kidney stones is hydration, right? You need to keep that urine dilute. You don't want to see a lot of color in it. That means that uh, the salts that are in your uh, urine are, are staying in solute form or dissolved. Um, you know, depending on what type of stone you have, there are other things you can do, whether it's dietary or medication. Um, so uh, that all depends on the particular type of stone disease you have. Uh, this next question goes right along with what you just answered. I get kidney stones a lot. Any advice for prevention is appreciated. We've already touched on that. Yeah, I think, you say? I, I think we beat that one. Away. Yeah. Um, no pun, yeah. no pun intended. But we're going to keep on going. Okay. Uh, Sunny Stunner says, how, do you, how to keep our urinary system healthy as we get older and get more problems with it? I think you pretty much touched base on that one. This one comes from Carolyn M. Thompson. Any suggestions for people with interstitial cystitis yeah, other than watching what you eat? Interstitial cystitis, that's another tough problem. Um, you know, that, that's one of these uh, diagnoses of exclusion diagnoses. And what that means is that, um, you know, you've ruled out everything else. These are, are often women, although some men get it, where they have a lot of frequency, urgency, pain, crampy type pain. Uh, they won't have necessarily, have, they won't have blood in their urine, they won't have infection, they won't have cancer, and you really can't put your finger on anything um, specific. Um, in its milder form, it'll have symptoms like that. Uh, in, in a major form, they'll have ulcerations that can lead to a contracted and, and disabling symptoms. Um, what can you do? Um, it, it's, it's a tough problem. There are medications out there that are FDA approved for it. I, I don't, I'm not going to go into that here, but there are medications that are approved for treatment. Um, there are other options for treatment, um, but unfortunately, that's a difficult problem. Um, is that is that interstitial cystitis? In, is in, that interstitial? Okay, I'll say, leave that. Say it with me. Interstitial. Interstitial. Wisticker. <laughs> Okay, uh, I, th my question about that, though, is because she says, other than what you eat, is that something that food triggers? It's not that, it, well, I, it can be a trigger. A, a lot of times, spicy foods or alcohol, things like that, uh, uh, patients will have a lot of symptoms with it. Mm. So, you know, they end up, uh, they, they usually can identify a diet that, that doesn't cause them to have symptoms. It, it's similar to, to people with, you know, bowel issues. Um, that uh, identify what they can have um, in order to not have symptoms. Okay, the next one comes from Carly. Melody Champion says UTIs. These women just want to know everything about UTIs. So we are covering a lot of that. This comes from Carly140. Help, just found out I have kidney stones, one in each kidney. Can I treat them from home somehow? Um, Again, because stone disease is such a broad category, um, you know, everything depends on how big the stone is, what type of stone it is, you know, where it's located. Um, it sounds like you probably don't have symptoms. I mean, there are stones that can be dissolved with medication uh, from home, um, but I'm, I'd say that's few and far between. Uh, if it's a significant stone burden, meaning the size of the stone is, is large enough, you're going to have to have some type of intervention to try to get rid of it. Um, there are minimally invasive procedures. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the shockwave lithotripsy, where we um, send shockwave aimed at the stone to break it up into small, smaller particles. Yeah, and, and beyond lithotripsy, there are other procedures, minimal, minimally invasive endoscopies that can be done uh, and lasers and uh, the laser to break up stones um, further. Uh, so I, I, a lot of that requires, um, uh, you can't do that in the house, I guess, is the okay. answer. All right, so the next one comes from Sally Ann Walker. She said, my husband is always going to the toilet. He is 65. He has type 2 diabetes, but his very recent bloods 
Uh, his HbA1c was within normal range for diabetes. The GP thought maybe his blood sugars were not well controlled, and that was why he was going to the loo so often. But his consult consultant is really pleased with his results. I don't know how if it is his prostate. He has no issues with actually peeing. It took me some serious nagging to get him to get his blood done. He insists that it is not his prostate. Typical man. Is it his prostate, Dr. Lou? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, what's it sound like? If a man came to you and says, I'm peeing all the time, but I don't have a problem with my flow or anything like that. I'm just peeing all the time. Well, I mean, that's the type of man, you know, that's a complicated case. I mean, he's diabetic. Uh, he, um, uh, he may have problems related to his diabetes that are causing that, although she said he's well controlled. Uh, he may have a prostate issue. Um, it may not necessarily be affecting his flow, but it could cause his bladder to become irritable and cause him to go frequently. And then there are a whole host of other reasons why someone could have frequency, uh, which is, you know, we don't have time to go into all of that, but there are many other causes. It doesn't have to be his prostate. So he may be right. Okay. Uh, this one. I'm, I'm in your corner. <laughs> okay. The next one says, hello, I have a 7.5 kidney stone with subsequent stent. What are the chances of more stones? Thank you. Well, who's up? That comes from, uh, I can't. Uh, Jackie, Jackie back. Ba Jackie back. Well, Jackie, I, I'm I'm sorry Glad to hear. I, I'm so, sorry to hear <laughs> about your uh, your, your 7.5. I'm assuming that's a 7.5 millimeter stone, which is a good size stone. If you have a stent in place, I'm assuming that you probably had some obstruction, and they put that in to get you out of pain. You're going to have to probably have something done, whether it's lithotripsy or uh, what's called ureteroscopy with a, a laser to try and get rid of that. Um, once the stent is out, you know. What's your risk? I'd say in the next couple of years is your greatest risk for recurrent stone disease. Um, I can't tell you exactly, you know, a statistic on um, what your particular chance of it is. But, you know, you, you should take measures to help prevent stone disease. I'm assuming this is your first stone. We are getting down to the nitty gritty. We have two questions left, but then I'm going to ask my own some things that weren't asked. All right, for Lou. Would love to hear about the connection between estrogen loss and a woman's urinary tract. What does he think of using localized estrogen cream for urinary health? Thank you. I think we touched on yeah, this. Yeah, we touched on this. I'll, I'll answer it again. Uh, maybe I can answer it better here. That, that women, when they lose estrogens, either through surgery or menopause, they, what happens is there are changes that occur within the vagina. The cells uh, become uh, atrophic, uh, the tissue in there becomes uh, friable, meaning it becomes uh, irritable and bleeds easily, uh, it's very uncomfortable, uh, and it loses its ability to uh, produce um, sugars and that which promote healthy bacteria uh, in the vaginal region. When that happens, the unhealthy or the pathologic bacteria like E. coli can then colonize or live in that area and that puts the woman at risk for developing a urinary tract infection. So by giving supplemental estrogen, and in this case I'm talking about maybe a small um, uh, cream uh, a few times a week in, in the vaginal area that the patient can do themselves, that can help promote the health of the vaginal tissue and promote the healthy bacteria uh, to recur or come back and thereby uh, help reduce the uh, incidence of infection. It may not be a panacea, but it may help reduce the incidence of, in, of infection. This is the last question, my friends. I have a question for Lou if he decides to do a Q&A. My husband had an episode a few years ago where he was having kidney stones left and right. One was super huge and required surgery. What would Lou recommend for general urinary health prevention of stones? Thank you so much. I know yeah. you've pretty much touched on those, yeah. but I wanted to get everyone's question in. Yeah, I, again, um, in recurrent stone formers, if you have a recurrent stone former, uh, as opposed to somebody that just maybe had one, that's the type of person that may benefit from what we call metabolic evaluation. And that's where we do blood and urine tests and try to look for something wrong, either in the bloodstream or at the kidney level uh, that could be causing recurrent infection. I mean, sorry, recurrent stones. 
Um, oftentimes then they can be directed either to medication or dietary changes or things to help prevent future stone formation. Uh, generally a one-time stone former, I mean, I had a stone once, you know, way back when. Ironically, my stone occurred. Go ahead which, and tell your little story. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, when we become board certified, we take a three-day exam. You know, the first day you do x-rays and uh, path slides, and then you do two days of uh, orals where, you know, you, you get questioned. And between the second and third day at night, I started having terrible back pain and blood in the urine, and I was like, I can't believe this. You know, I'm having a kidney stone. And my partner who... Had you ever had one before? No. Okay. But, you know, I spent a week uh, with, you know, 200 stressed out guys uh, getting ready for this exam, drinking a lot of coffee. And, you know, I probably um, got dehydrated. And so I formed a stone. And, uh, you know, what happened was I was lucky. I ended up passing the stone, uh, fortunately, within a couple hours. Uh, and my, as my partner told me, I'd have to come back next year if I went to the emergency room that night. Uh, so I fell fast asleep, and he was so stressed out from it that he couldn't sleep the whole night, <laughs> and he was mad at me. <laughs> and didn't he tell you to suck it up? He did. He said, <laughs> he said, he said take an aspirin, hug your pillow, and yeah, exactly. suck it up. Exactly. All right, I have, uh, I have a couple questions I'm going to ask Lou, and one uh, involves painful intercourse with women. And I did talk about this in a menopause video that it's because of the, the loss of estrogen and also the thinning of the skin. But um, what are some things that, and I've talked about, you know, uh, lubrication and, uh, you know, you've said use it or lose it. Um, and, you know, a couple other things. But my question is, is how can a woman help her partner to understand how painful it is that she doesn't not want to have intimacy with him, but it's very, very painful. How can a woman help a man to understand this? I'm very fortunate because Lou is a doctor and he understands, but some men don't. They just want it and that's all there is to it. So how can a woman help a man to understand? Um, I think one thing you could do is take a, a fine grit sandpaper. <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> and and and, and uh, let him ple pleasure himself with that, and we'll see. <laughs> and tell him this is this, this would might be, get taken off. This, I don't know. This, this might be a, a corollary to what it feels like uh, intervaginally, yeah. and then uh, maybe they would understand. But seriously, I mean, there has to be a way. I mean, maybe use that analogy. Uh, you I, know. I mean it. it I guess you could say if I used a fine grit sandpaper on yeah. you, that's what it would feel like. Exactly. I, I mean... And, and, and for a woman, estrogen cream can help that, correct? It, yeah, sure. I mean, if we can, if we can get the vaginal uh, tissue to regenerate uh, to the level where, you know, it's, it's no longer this thin atrophic, atrophic means, you know, well, but, look at my people. It, oh, sorry. Look if, at my people. All right. Three, two, one. So <laughs> if we could, if we could if, if, with an estrogen supplement, uh, if you can re rejuvenate the tissue enough, then you might be able to get it to where uh, intercourse wouldn't be painful. Okay. So we're done with all the questions. And I thought maybe I would just ask Lou a couple of questions about himself and maybe uh, help you to get to know this fabulous human being that I call mine. <laughs> um, I'm getting emotional. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. Why don't you tell me, what are some of your hobbies? Um, well, I mean, I, 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 golf is probably my biggest um, uh, sports hobby. Um, I, how many games have you played? Oh, I don't want to go. Yes, yeah, since retirement. Come on. How many? Well, during COVID, right, in 2020, we were, we were basically, you know, trapped in, in, in here in Florida. Uh, we couldn't, oh, we could, we could, we, well, no, we couldn't go back because no, of, uh, yeah. you know, with teaching right, and, right. and that. So Lou also teaches. Yes. He teaches yeah. uh, at the university and you are teaching. Tell him. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor. I teach anatomy and physiology at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, uh, which I love. And I he mean, loves it. Yeah. Loves it. Yeah. I, I, re I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy it, but I really do. Uh, okay, so get back to your hobbies now. Uh, golf, and to answer your question, we or I had 320 rounds in 2020. 
<laughs> How many have so far now? I don't know. I, I haven't. A lot. A lot. You earned it. You uh, earned every yeah. single day of as, doing it. You as, worked hard throughout as, your whole career. As, as one of my friends says, if the day ends in why, he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You want to tell a joke? Uh, I don't. I, well, I was going to say about other hobbies, uh, as you alluded to, are uh, investing in uh, financial planning. Um, uh, you know, I still enjoy skating occasionally when oh, I get out yeah. there. Well, well, why don't we do, why don't we, yeah, okay, there we go. What did you, what did you want to be when you were in high school? What was your, your dream? Your, what was the one thing you wanted out of life? Well, you know, what she's alluding to is yeah. uh, at that point in my life, I was, play, I grew up in Massachusetts. I was playing a lot of hockey and ice hockey. And I, I wanted to make that my career. Uh, and I credit my high school coach who sat me down and said, you're not going to make it, you know, and uh, that was crushing. Um, well, I think there was a little Dorothy uh, in there as well. Didn't Dorothy say something to you about your skating? Well, she said I skated like a gazelle. <laughs> that wasn't going to get me to the NHL. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I credit my high school coach who sat me down and said I wasn't going to make it. Uh, and so that, you know, was crushing. But... From that, you know, I picked myself up and decided that I, you know, was going to have to make hit a, the books, hit, make a career choice. And the other hobbies? Um, well, one of my other hobbies is I, I picked this up late in life. You know, I was never a hunter because of me. I was never a hunter or a um, uh, gun guy, but I did um, I did get into uh, target shooting um, within the last five to seven years, and uh, you know, it's I find it relaxing and enjoyable you know it's challenging and so that's something else that I like to do he, he started uh, late because I had I, I really um, I needed to be comfortable with it. it's like he would like to um, learn how to fly but me down on the ground him up there I um, probably would uh, what, what would I do go crazy yeah, you, you couldn't. <laughs> no I couldn't Bra no. ground school is as far I, as I got right? yeah. <laughs> but he's okay with it he's okay and then fishing Oh yeah, you like to fish. Yeah, you have your uh, hobby. He likes yeah. to do a hobby. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're fortunate enough that we live on water, so yeah. uh, I can get out. My I can car. honestly say that retirement has been really good for Lou because it has, um, as a, a, a surgeon, there was always a level of stress in his life because he's not one of those doctors that came home and just shut it off. He's always been the type of doctor that came home and his patients were always there, especially if he had uh, someone who had a big surgery or um, you know anything can happen. Someone asked me um, the in a, a question um, something about surgery and oh, she needed to have her knee replacement and she was worrying about it. Was she not, was this normal to worry about it? And I answered her and said that any surgery comes with risk. Sure. And I think that most people that go into a surgery are scared. I think that's a normal, healthy response. I mean, I'd be, I'd be worried about somebody that I was operating on that didn't have some concern or fear, but I always wanted them to make sure going into it that every question had been answered to the point where they were sure that's what they wanted to do. Right, right, exactly. So if you're watching, it's very normal for you to be afraid. Oh yeah, yeah but, I, I would be. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I've told you all many times, the people who uh, accuse me of having a facelift, I would never, ever have an elective surgery. No. He's my witness right here. I would never, because there are so many risks. Sure. I mean, you, you hear, you hear, unfortunately, you hear about uh, yes. everybody's human and, and human error occurs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Do you have a joke to tell us, Louie? Any joke? Got to keep it clean. This is YouTube. Is Cause I, he, is, I got friends in low places. Is I don't know. <laughs> is that? Oh, no, that wouldn't be a good one. Uh, let's see. Anything Jerry has told you that's really cute? Well, I don't know. It's his, his, his. Coup de gras. I, I think the last thing I would say is because I, I know a lot of people are embarrassed or nervous about talking about these types of issues. And 
for a urologist, they and even a gynecologist, they deal with this stuff every single day. Yeah. So there's nothing to be embarrassed that's about. That's what I always tell um, them. You know, just lay it out there for them so that they can help you. That's, that's what they're there for. That's what they're there for. All right, my and friends, so that's it for today's video. I'd like to say thank you to Lou for doing this. Remember, this was about just picking his brain. It is not to diagnose you or give you any medical advice just picking the man's brain. He's a board certified urologist, so he's been through it all. And if you uh, have any other questions that you would like to put down there, perhaps that he didn't touch on, uh, go ahead and put them down and we'll consider doing this again. It's not going to be an everyday thing, but maybe once every couple of months, Lou will have the desire to be on camera again and come and uh, I'm not going to have him do my makeup or anything like that. Okay, so don't put that in the comments. It would be fun to have Lou do your makeup because we're not doing that. No. But the camera does love me. Oh, the camera loves Lou. Everything loves and, Louie. Everything. Now, if you remember. haven't already subscribed, I would love to have you as an ageless beauty. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Louie's waiting for me to hit 200,000. Yeah. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Yep. Hit that like button and leave a comment below. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's I, that's all the ones I watch, that's what they say. All right, my all right. friends, you go out in the world and be lovable. And remember, I love you all. Bisous.